couple days. So it'll be available there as well. All right. So again, like Molly said, we're going to be doing most of our work today. We're going to be um, outside of the slide deck. Up here at the top is the URL that you'll be going to bit.ly forward slash student underscore podcasting. There's no capital letters in any of that. Um, this is the website that we've set up to do these sessions. Today we're talking about using podcasts. Tomorrow we'll be talking about creating podcasts. So I would encourage you to come back tomorrow, but all that information can be found right here. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click over there. And if you didn't get it, that's fine. It's on every page of the website as well. Um, so again, the URL is bit.ly forward slash student underscore podcasting. And just like Molly said, as we're going through this, if you have a comment or a question, or if I've gone too fast or I'm going too slow, or we are, then please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, you can unmute and let us know. That'd be fine too. Uh, we want this to be, you know, a bit of an interactive experience where we can kind of talk about how we're using these things and what we can do with them. So um, just feel free to, to chime in at any time. Okay. And if you have an example of how you use it, use the chat or let us know. Like that's exactly what, uh, you know, Chris just added a new resource moments before we started today. So we're really always evolving and adding based on what we're learning as we go. So we yeah. do really encourage that. The other thing I would encourage is keep this URL um, because just like Molly said, we are evolving. We are changing. This website has changed multiple times in the last month and a half. Um, I'd like to think that it's gotten a lot better and the content has gotten a lot better as we find more things and we learn more from the teachers that we're working with about how people are using podcasts and what they're doing. So it's a fluid thing and I would I would appreciate if you keep that URL, come back to it and you, you're free to use any of the resources that I have posted up here. Anything, you know, that's that's here is for you to use. All right. So just again, um, information about us. This, of course, is my contact information, my email address, and you can find me on Twitter at Tech Guy Benick. Life Through Lyrics is a personal podcast that I produce. Um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't put out an episode in a little over a year because I just haven't had time to do it, but that is my personal podcast about music and music history, so um, you can check that out if you want to. This, of course, is Molly's contact information. Again, her email address and her Twitter handle here at Molly Brandon. And then um, I'm not sure if Stacy's with us today. She was going to try to jump in, but Stacy um, is again our ILC in the western part of the state. And her contact information, email address, and Twitter handle are here. All right. Now, I said before that we are passionate about podcasting. And because of that, we've actually, as ILCs, have started two podcasts um, since March. The first one is called Moments of Inspiration. Uh, it can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, and a plethora of other um, podcast platforms. If you see them down here, it can be found on Breaker, on Stitcher, on CastBox, um, Radio Public, and a few others as well. Um, so if you're not familiar with Moments of Inspiration, it's tagged as a podcast by Educators for Educators where we share what's right with the world for a change. This is just for us to share some positive stories about what we're encountering in teaching or with our colleagues um, just to kind of lift each other up. So we did a 12 episode season one uh, from March till June and we're getting ready to kick off season two um, right now. And we would also ask that you consider contributing to Moments of Inspiration or our other podcasts, okay? So again, you can find that here. I'm going to let Molly address um, our other podcast. Hold on one second, which should be right here, which is Podcast PDNC. So if Moments of Inspiration is storytelling, Podcast PDNC is pedagogy. So we just wanted an opportunity where unlike this session, where you have to log in, be at a certain place at a certain time in front of a computer screen. Um, we wanted to reach people with the same kind of content and, and message around professional development, but something that you can take on the go. So we call this listen and launch instead of sit and get, <laughs> where you can think you can listen to something and it'll launch you into some kind of practice or um, tweaking a practice that you might already have. So we have, a couple things on here already around um, 
um, like blended learning is our most recent one. We did a one on communication and connection. We did one on building norms, choosing the right digital tools. So these are things that we could do a PD session on, but all, we could also plug in and listen uh, while you're doing your chores, getting in some steps, those kinds of things. So um, most of these inter have been interviews with uh, different educators around the state. So that's something to listen for as well, is that you're hearing from people within the field. You're not listening to professional developers who don't actually work with students and who don't actually work in a in a district. You're getting some really good um, content. So this is what I was saying. If I if I can do that, <laughs> if I can figure out how to um, you know get these stories and record them and put them out, I promise anybody can. So. And like I said, we'll address tomorrow in tomorrow's PD session. We'll talk about specifically how we actually create the podcast and those kind of things. But today we want to talk about, again, using podcasts themselves. All right. So just real quick, if you guys would tell me in the chat um, if you have experience, if you are in if you are a podcast listener and maybe what the last podcast you listened to was. I'm going to give you about two minutes to do that. OK. Chris, do you know about this one, Counterclock, that Carrie wrote about? I saw that. I saw it pop up, and I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. Oh, you and your true crime, you need to listen to it. I started listening to one the other day called, um, oh, man, I can't even remember what it was called. But it was a, it was a, if you've ever listened to Crime Town, it's along those lines. Okay. So, um looks like we have a couple people who like crime ones yes um, yeah. but you'll like so it's it's yeah. about a, a murder here on the outer banks and it's i think they're opening the investigation back up and so out here there's billboards everywhere about this podcast it's gotten a really big following oh well then i will be i will be listening to that soon oh Catherine, i listen to this american life as well it's on my listener list Oh, I really like these suggestions. I have new things to, um, ooh, the new season is a murder and mania. There you go. Um, I have new things to add. I don't know when I'm going to have time to listen to all these, but John Spencer is one of my favorites. Carmen, I see that you posted about that one. Elizabeth, I'll drop the, the name of that in the chat so you can have it to look up uh, tomorrow's podcasting session. So yeah, so what I wanted to see was kind of if, if we have some people that are <laughs> that are listening. Um, I'll tell you what, um, I will go back after. I, Catherine, that's a good question. I'll go back after this session and I'll um, I'll put those in a list and I'll post them to the website. I'll put a page on the website um, for what teachers are listening to. How's that? Um, I think that's a good idea, actually. So. Um, so we're just going to kind of I'm going to move forward as everybody I'm going to assume that everybody's gotten to the website at this point. So if you'll notice over on the left hand side, the navigation, what we're going to talk about today are why we podcast or why we use podcasts in general. And that would be why we listen to podcasts and why we have students or why we ourselves create podcasts. Um, secondly, we're going to go on to this is kind of our agenda, how we can use podcasts in um, our curriculum or with our students. And then I'm going to give you some examples, some concrete examples of podcasts that people are actually using with their students or that teachers are actually listening to for professional development purposes. And then I think I'm going to add a section at the bottom of that for listening for pleasure. And that's where I'll put some of these podcasts down there too. All right. So I'm going to jump to why we listen to podcasts or why we use podcasts. And just to get started, I want to talk a little bit about what a podcast is and at its simplest root and and you know at first people get bogged down thinking well a podcast is is a is a highly produced fancy you know audio or video file something like that it doesn't have to be a podcast can simply be a recording a digital recording of a voice that you are able to share in different mediums so if you can save it as an mp3 for example then people can listen to it on a tablet they can listen to it on a computer on a smartphone 
um, in you know a, a lot of different ways that people can listen. So it becomes mobile in that regard. And that's essentially at its base, again, what a podcast is. It's a simple um, transferable file, something that's mobile that you can take with you. All right. Now, <clears throat> this short video right here, five reasons to pilot student podcasting projects. It's very short, but I do just want you to take a minute and watch this because I could go through and, and say a lot of words here, but John Spencer does it a little bit better than me and he put this together so i'm not big on reinventing the wheel and if you're familiar with john spencer he has a great blog there's a link to it right underneath this video a podcast is a series of audio files that you can download and listen to on pretty much any device most podcasts come in a series and podcast listeners will subscribe to their favorite podcasts using an app so why should students podcast? Number one, it doesn't take fancy equipment. Students can record and even edit audio on their smartphones or tablets. Number two, you can listen on the go. Students have access anywhere and at any time to new ideas and perspectives. And meanwhile, you as a teacher get a chance to check for understanding on the go. Number three, it's a chance for students to develop their voice. Here, students own the entire process from inquiry and research up through composition, editing, and launching. Number four, it's a chance for all students to participate. Because you can prep ahead of time and edit afterwards, each student can create their episodes at their own pace. And number five, it develops lifelong skills like critical thinking, empathy, and communication. Okay, so a lot of that had to do with the creation of podcasts, but some of that bleeds over into actually listening to them and using them as well. But let's talk a little bit about ListenWise. ListenWise is a company that, that specializes in educational podcasting, so in curating podcasts for educators to use and in giving educators tools um, in order to create podcasts on their own. So they have this really great infographic um, that was just updated in the last year or so, actually, uh, about why podcasting and storytelling is a good resource for you in class. Just a couple of numbers. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but a couple of the numbers that really struck me. Um, for example, that, you know, we think a lot of us probably think, well, podcast is mainly an adult thing. But in their study, they found that one in three Americans from ages 12 to 25 listen on their own to a podcast monthly. So they subscribe to something, they listen to it. And think about how many of our students are watching YouTube videos and following people on YouTube and those kind of things, TikTok. They get into a trend of following something, they find something that's interesting to them and they will follow it. So if we can get them into the podcasting realm as well, we can be helping them out, all right? And then also, down below that 50 percent of all u.s homes are podcast fans so it's kind of funny because my daughter is away at college right now so literally in my house there's a 50 50 split my wife is not a podcast fan and i am a podcast fan so it's kind of like half the people that you see are going to be people who listen to or are familiar with podcasts in general you can see how listenership has increased from 2013 to 2018 um, and it continues to increase after that all right now here, and I'm going to get into this in just a second, why are stories so engaging? And, and think of a podcast like an audio book, all right? So why are stories so engaging? It's because it's a full brain workout, and I'm going, to, I'm going to touch on that in just a second. And it's also much easier to remember a narrative um, more than a straightforward lecture because your brain is engaged in the story. So you can have your students get the same information that you might give them in a lecture, but in almost a story form, they're going to be more likely to retain that information. OK, when we talk about them creating podcasts, then, you know, what what does that look like? OK, it teaches them the idea of and this goes with listening too, because we're teaching them effective listening here. So it, these three components of effective listening take place for listeners as well as creators. The first being problem solving because they're using Basically, they're using syntax to figure out the meaning of words they don't know, all right? Planning and evaluation, so they have to plan when they're going to listen. They have to put the side, aside the time so that they're able to listen, and they have to set goals for it, maybe take notes, do 
um, reflection activities, those kind of things, whatever you have them do with it, just like you would if you had them read in class. And then focusing attention, the more focused the listening, the better the learning. One of the things about using podcasts is, you know, your students can put their earbuds in and simply focus on the words that they're hearing, maybe try to drown out some of the noise around them a little bit, all right? So why should we teach with podcasts? Because 85% of what we learn, we learn from listening, but only 10% of our population listens effectively. So we can use this medium to help our students to listen effectively so that they learn better, okay? And if you wanna see more about um, what ListenWise has to say, of course, there's a link right here to where that came from, all right? Now, <clears throat> some teachers think, well, you know, I've got to focus on my reading and my writing because that's, you know, really one of the, those are the two tenets that I've really got to look at so that my kids can be successful. But when I was a Spanish teacher, we always focused on actually four different things, which were speaking, listening, reading, and writing. And this study here that I'm going to share with you and the information about it, What's interesting about it is these scientists actually wanted to study how the brain works when it's reading versus how the brain works when it's listening. And they expected to find a lot of differences between the two. But surprisingly, what they found was that your brain actually does all the same things when it's listening, if it's listening effectively, that it does when you're reading. So we can use, again, this medium to, to help our students learn in ways that maybe we hadn't thought of before, okay? Now, I'm not obviously gonna read the article for you. I will open it up so you can see it, okay? Um, this was done, it's posted by a student from UC Berkeley, okay? And it goes through and you can certainly read all of the information there. It's pretty interesting. One thing I will say is it does touch on the idea of using podcasts for differentiation. So if you have students with dyslexia or other reading disorders, that podcasts are a great way to bring them material as well, all right? And then it talks a little bit about this brain map. And that's what I, that's the thing that I wanted to show you I thought was pretty cool. So they actually put out this brain map that went along with their study, okay? And wait for it to come up here. There's a lot of information available for you looking through this. And a lot of it is highly, highly technical. And I'll be honest with you, some of it even I don't understand. I don't understand at all, actually, but um, what I did find interesting, hoping that this is going to open, is that basically, in basic terms, when you're looking at somebody's brain, and this is one of the subjects from their study, and what they did was they had people listen to 10 hours of a podcast called The Moth, which is a storytelling podcast, and they monitored their brains to find out how much of their brain was actually working, and what they expected to get was um, a large discrepancy between how hard your brain was working when you're reading versus how hard your brain was working when you're listening. But all of the colored areas on this person's brain were active during the time that they were listening to these podcasts. Now, if you look at the lower left-hand side of the screen, the colors match up to basically the types of words that they were hearing and the things that they were hearing. So if you click on an individual part of this person's brain, for example, if I click on this blue right here, okay, if it's gonna work, it's gonna show me the top 20 or so words in a word cloud that basically affected that side of the brain, all right? And you can go through, it's, it's really cool to look at, um, to go through their information and see, but Basically, what you'll notice as you look at it and as you look around is there's not a lot of areas that aren't active or working. Now, some of these lighter areas, you see it's not as active. It's active, but it's not as active. And that's what it means if the word cloud is smaller. But as you go through, you'll see that the majority of your brain is working at the same capacity when you're listening as it is when you're reading. Okay. And Molly is our, our literacy expert, so I'm sure that, you know, she may or may not have a comment on this, but basically when we're trying to, to help our kids to learn, if we put those two things together, if we did reading and we did listening, then basically they could be getting that information twice and think of how powerful that could be. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, that image and the idea of the study that went into how our brain is responding, you know, and I, I've 
never really thought about it that way with podcasting, but you know, you think about how many teachers read aloud to their students, you know, and they listen, you listen to read alouds. It's one of the very first ways you learn to read is listening to others read. And, you know, that it just goes to show what I love about podcasting, though, is yes, there's some great fiction things in there, but there's also a much better chance of personalizing learning to what is interesting to students by being able to expose them to a variety of informational podcasts. So um, to me, that it, it just kind of goes along with that same thread. But I really love that you found that resource. Um, so I haven't had a chance to keep up with the chat. Have I missed any questions or anything? No, so far um, we had a great question about using it different subjects, like that some subjects might be better suited to podcasting, like math. Mm -hmm. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about that as well, but I did drop um, an article. Well, I know we're going to get more to that about different subjects, but I did put something in there. So if anyone's missed the chat, there's some good things in there. And feel free to ask questions. And again, we could talk about podcasts for more than 80 minutes. We're not going to today, but we could. Um, so if there, you know, what we want this conversation to be as helpful as possible to you. Right. So, and, and, and what I also, you know, what I want you guys to take away from this is, you know, the podcasting isn't just a fad. It's been around for quite a long time now and educators, there's a lot of educators have been using it in class very effectively. So it's not kind of that new thing that that is, it's not necessarily going to go away. It's it's something that we can use and add into our practice. And exactly like Molly just said, just like read-alongs, just like, you know, when we have students read in class and do those kind of things, this could be a new tool that we use all the time. All right. Now this infographic is um, from, <clears throat> excuse me, also came from a Listen Wise article. Again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it just talks about how audio promotes literacy and a couple of the things on this one that really, really, really stuck out to me and I thought were interesting was, first of all, if we look down here at this two grade levels, you know, for somebody who hasn't studied the, the science of reading as much as, say, your media specialists and, and those kind of people have, maybe even some of your English teachers, um, for somebody who hasn't studied the science of reading, it's interesting to me that students can listen and comprehend two grade levels above what their reading level is. So if we're using podcasts from elementary all the way through, then we can be helping our students to push their reading levels to help with their reading. Because a lot of these podcasts, and we're going to talk about this, have transcripts that you can use with them. So they can read along as they're listening. So, you know, we can really push that, excuse me, that envelope of, you know, what they're able to, what they're able to comprehend. Okay. And then um, lastly here, and I don't talk a lot about test scores because I'm not big on test scores, to be honest with you, but where it says here that test scores increase 21% when engaged in multimodal learning versus single mode. So just like I talked about a second ago, if we have our students read information about what they're learning and we have them listen to information about what they're learning and we have them speak about what they're learning, then, you know, and, and then of course write about it. If we're doing those things, we're obviously going to enhance their retention and we're going to enhance what they're learning and what they're getting out of that information. Okay. So again, there's a link down here if you're interested in looking at anything else that came from those articles, but I thought that they were pretty interesting. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about a couple of things that are near and dear to us as North Carolina educators, right? And the first of those is going to be personalized learning. You know, one of the things, and Molly's already mentioned it, is the idea of this personalized learning and working towards the individual student. So if you're not familiar with the four pillars of personalized learning in North Carolina, these four up here are what we're going to look at. That's learner profiles, individualized learning paths, competency-based progression, and flexible learning environments. Okay. Now you can take podcasting, and when I say podcasting, I mean in general. So that means listening to, again, as well as creating podcasts. You can take podcasting and directly tie podcasting into or correlate or align it to three of these four 
personalized learning pillars, okay, without a problem. So Molly and I and Stacy, we sat down and looked at this and said, well, you know, which ones align the best? And it was interesting, again, to kind of see how well podcasting aligns to some of these. So as far as the individualized learning path goes, okay, so here, when you're using podcasting, listening and creating, we can use podcasts as part of a choice board, for example, or a playlist or a pathway as part of a hyperdoc or some other student-centered approach to learning that helps students make decisions and take ownership. So maybe the whole class doesn't listen to the same podcast. Maybe it's part of your choice board or part of your hyperdoc or pathway. And, you know, half of your students end up choosing to listen to it and half of them choose another path. But by giving options such as podcasts and other things to do, then we are supporting or we are aligning to this individualized learning path pillar of personalized learning. OK. Competency based progression. All right. So here, you know, we can use podcasts as part of our assessment process. They can be formative or summative. And, and this would probably play more into the idea of creating podcasts, but it's a different way or it's a different medium for our students to show um, and apply what they've learned. So this is important as well, okay? <clears throat> and then flexible learning environments. Podcasting fits very well into this concept. It can be used as part of a station or rotation exercise. It can be used in small groups. It can be used as an individual activity. It can be used as a differentiation tool. Maybe you're only going to assign it to certain students. So podcasting, listening, and creating, okay, again, will tie into those three pillars of personalized learning in North Carolina very well. And that's going to be your individualized learning path, competency-based progression, and flexible learning environment. So why do I bring that up? Because when you're being observed or when you're talking to your administrators and they ask you how you're incorporating the pillars of personalized learning or what you're doing um, to align to these pillars, these are things that you can talk about and you can use, okay? And then you can also use them as artifacts as well. Molly, anything you want to add to that? No, I think that was perfect. All right, cool. All right. Now, let's talk about the next one, mm -hmm. right? That's also near and dear to our hearts, which is podcasting in the North Carolina Digital Learning Standards, all right? Now, we know, hopefully we know, but if we don't, the digital learning standards are adopted and they're going into play this school year, or they're already in play. They were adopted from the ISTE standards. So these are the same as the national digital learning standards. All right. There are, excuse me, seven different standards with substandards under each one. And Can I say something about standards. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So librarian here who understood all of the K-5 standards and the library standards and the personalized learning pillars. And now there's digital learning. Sta I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. And it overwhelms me to think about how to build bridges without calling it a crosswalk, because that also feels like a lot. And it looks like spaghetti junction, right? <laughs> and I mean, it is. So I've started calling these unofficially, so don't get mad at me. But I call them identities because if you look at these seven that I know Chris is getting ready to talk about, I see these as identities I want my students to have, not necessarily a standard that they're going to accomplish. Because uh, just looking at this top one, an empowered learner is what I am today in my 30s, not necessarily something I want a kindergartner to accomplish by the end of a year. So it's just I, I don't get any choice in calling it a standard because that's what was decided. But I refer to them as identity. So I wanted to just point that out and say, when we're talking about these things, you know, it it is all about reaching kids as individuals, right? And developing their identity. And um, podcasting might be a tiny little blip on that, but it is a way that you can maybe reach each and every child, as we heard Tabari Wallace talk about earlier today. All right, that's all, Chris. I just wanted to chime in because I get a little, I get fatigue of hearing standard, standard, standard. It is what it is, but I think these are really important, and I like that frame. No, that's great, and and you know when you say standard, and, and I, I sort of have to catch myself too. When you say standard, automatically you think somebody's going to be standing there with a checklist, right? And that's not what these are for. These are for us to help our students become more empowered, to become um, 
more able to be successful in the world that they live in and we live in as we move forward, right? So this is, a lot of these are things that we're already doing, but I just bring to your attention how podcasting aligns to each of these seven identities. I like the identity thing, each of these seven identities, because then I feel like by going through that, it made me feel better to go through that and put it together. I'm hoping it'll make you feel a little bit better about the DLS as well. Okay. So the first identity is an empowered learner. Again, not going to read all that to you. Um, it has, you know, it's one goal and then it's sub goals. But basically here we just say that podcasting supports empowered learners by requiring students to set goals, to develop strategies. It requires them to seek feedback and improvement, maybe from you, maybe from their peers. OK, and they also have to troubleshoot and work through. And I don't like to call them roadblocks. I like to call them speed bumps. And you'll find if you sit around in trainings with Stacy and Molly and I, we like to throw a lot of different things around like identities and speed bumps and those kind of things, because, you know, we're trying to look at look at things in the big picture. Right. And I call them speed bumps instead of roadblocks, because I think a roadblock is going to stop me. But a speed bump is just going to slow me down. So. The empowered learner is going to have the skills to work through those. All right. The next one is a digital citizen, and this one's really important. OK, what does podcasting do to align to and to teach our students to be good digital citizens or just good citizens in general? All right. It's going to require them to understand how to safely, ethically and legally distribute and use information. And that could be, um, you know, Obviously, literally what they're talking about, it could be a music file, it could be a, a video, it could be a image, something like that. But teaching them to give credit where credit is due and teaching them how to understand what is right and wrong in that realm and take care of themselves is crucially important with all of the information and everything that we have available to us out there. Just because it's available doesn't mean we should always use it. All right. It's also going to help them to understand what's real and what's fake. OK, so looking at that and looking at what their identity is going to be like online, all of these things tie in together to digital citizenship. Knowledge constructor, um, what does podcasting do to encourage or to align to the knowledge constructor identity? Um, it's going to require students to use a variety of resources, first of all. Because if you're going to create a podcast, yes, you're going to have to research or you're going to have to write your script. You're going to have to gather your information. You're going to have to decide what sounds you want to use with it. So you're going to have to curate those files. You're going to have to find a way to record it. You're going to have to find a way to put it all together. So it's not a one stop shop most of the time when we talk about podcasting. So we're going to have to use or we're going to have to construct, if you will, our podcast using a variety of resources. All right. And sometimes we're going to find some that work better than others. So we're going to have to really, you know, evaluate their validity as we go through and use some of these things. OK. And Molly, anything you want to jump in with, you feel free to interrupt me. OK. Um, as far as innovative designers, podcasting requires innovative designers to utilize the design process. And this goes back and you'll notice that these aren't standalone. OK, they're going to intertwine with each other. So just like when I talked about, excuse me, when I talked about empowered learners having to troubleshoot, that's going to play into your innovative designers because the design process is going to call for you to decide on some options for how you're going to do something to try doing it a certain way to then test that way out, figure out what the problems are, if any, with that, then go back and reiterate it, try it again and fix those things. So in order to create and use podcasts effectively, our students are going to have to be innovative designers. All right. Computational thinker. Um, you know, I didn't really think of podcasting as being something that would tie into this identity until I really dug into it. But the idea that, again, they're going to have to employ and develop strategies and theories for solving the inevitable issues that they're going to come up with, the roadblocks that they're or the speed bumps that they're going to encounter as they're working with technology. Because we know 
that when you're working with technology, it's not always perfect. Molly will tell you that today, for example, my computer's running a little bit slow. That's why she's recording the session because before we started today, we had to troubleshoot some issues there. So it's, it's definitely gonna encourage that computational thinker side. All right, creative communicators, um, is you know i think this one's kind of self-explanatory but they're going to repurpose digital resources to clearly express themselves to publish and present their final product all right so again just like before we're going to take a variety of things we're going to put them together we're going to construct a final product and we're going to communicate what we've learned in a creative way so global collaborators by sharing this information by working together it's encouraging our students to become global collaborators. It aligns to that particular identity, all right? Now, I know that probably wasn't the most exciting thing you sat through today as far as that goes. However, I do think it's important to kind of see how this ties into these things that we sort of talk about out there in space. We talk about the four pillars of personalized learning. We talk about the digital learning standards for students, but I like to kind of see how does it actually tie into what I'm talking about right now? Does anybody have any questions or concerns or anything before I move on to how to use podcasts? All right. Very good. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in case you can't tell, I'm a, I'm a big fan of an infographic. I love an infographic, but I like to, you know, I like to use my own, but I also like to use other people's and give them credit for it resource called Education Closet came up with this one, ideas for using podcasts in the classroom. And obviously we're not in, some of us are, and some of us are not in the classroom right now, um, but we are still teaching our students. So it's the same basic concept, all right? What I'd like you to do is look at these four over here on the right and the purpose of podcasts in the classroom. And it kind of breaks it down two and two. Two of these speak to having your students listen to and use podcasts for their learning. And two of them have to do with your students basically creating information on their own or creating podcasts. So the first is to provide information in a fun and entertaining way, thus increasing student engagement, okay? So when we circle back and we think about, again, presenting information to students in a variety of ways, we can use podcasts in a flipped model, we can use podcasts in a blended model. So students can work with podcasts in an asynchronous fashion when they're out of class and then bring that information to you in your synchronous environment. So you can use it to jumpstart a lesson or you can use it to supplement maybe what it is that you're talking about. So, for example, um, if you're a history teacher, there's a podcast called Stuff I Missed in History Class. OK, Stuff I Missed in History Class is an amazing source for finding some good stories surrounding some of the things that we talk about in the social studies classroom. And I'll show you another example for that later on. But there's examples out there for just about every subject. All right. And sometimes, and I found this when I was teaching Spanish, sometimes, as much as we don't want to admit it, sometimes it's, it's fun and more engaging for our students to hear somebody else say it as opposed to just us. That was one of the things that I always found to be effective was my students needed to hear somebody other than me speak Spanish. So they had to hear things in a different way. And maybe the way that the information is presented will click with somebody a little bit better or different than it clicked when it came from you. So again, we can use it as a supplement there. Secondly, we can extend student learning with critical links between content areas. Same basic concept, but we can we can encourage them to learn more. We can encourage them to dig deeper into whatever it is that we're studying or whatever it is that we're talking about in class. Number three, and, and these two, again, sort of lean into the podcast creation idea, which is something that we're going to talk about tomorrow. But for number three, synthesizing student learning through podcast creation. Just like I talked about a little while ago, these can be formative assessments, small formative assessments along the way. Maybe you're a math teacher and you are going to give them an assignment and you want them to explain in words, I'm, I'm not a math teacher, but explain in words how they use the FOIL method to solve an equation, okay? And you give them an equation to solve. 
It could be something like that. It could be a um, summative assessment where they take a lot of information or everything that you've done and put it all together and show you what they learned all together. So it's a different medium, a different way to produce that product so that you can monitor their learning and you can adjust your teaching as necessary. OK, and then this last one, I don't think a lot of people think about this, but I think it's really powerful and it is something that Molly and Stacy and I have talked about. How great would it be if you as a teacher just created a five minute podcast every week? And again, a podcast can just be a digital recording of your voice. If you created a five minute podcast every week where you talked about what you did in class or what you did this week, what went well. All right. And maybe touched on what was going to happen next week, what students needed to be prepared for next week. And maybe as you moved on and you started doing this, maybe you have a student submit something to go with it too, to talk about an assignment or give a reflection on something. You could post this in your Google Classroom. You could post this on Canvas. You could post this on your teacher website. So when I say a podcast, it doesn't necessarily have to show up on Spotify. It doesn't have to show up on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. You can keep these things private, and in so doing, you can share it with a limited number of people. So just like getting that phone call from the school or getting that folder from elementary school with all the information in it, this could be another way that we communicate with family members, uh, with parents, with the community in general, and get our stories out as well, get our voice out there. OK. <clears throat> Down at the bottom, it gives you some podcasting ideas. Um, these are all pretty general. All right. Um, it, at the elementary level, of course, if we were in the classroom setting. So those of you who are in a plan B setting where you have your students in class, consider trying to use podcasts as a center. I mean, you could do that at any grade level. Works really well um, at any grade level. But Again, at the elementary level, this is a good way to introduce them. And when I say using a podcast, too, let me just backtrack and say that I'm not talking about you don't have to listen to an entire podcast. So we, you don't have to have your students listen to an entire 30 minute or entire hour podcast. You can have them listen to a segment. You can cut out a segment. Some of the podcasting resources that I'm going to show you will actually give you segments in pieces along the way so you can pick a segment for your students to listen to. So if you tell your students, for example, to listen to minutes, you know, from minute 109 to or from minute from one minute, nine seconds to three minutes, 15 seconds, that's the segment you want them to listen to to get what you want out of that. OK. A <clears throat> couple of articles here. Um, the first two the seven ways to use synth with K-12 students and five ways teachers use synth. Synth is a podcasting tool that we'll talk about tomorrow um, when we talk about creating podcasts. But these articles talk about how some teachers are using these in their K-12 classrooms. But I include it here because these ideas transcend just synth. You don't just have to use them with the synth platform. You can use them with really any platform you wanted to for student creation of podcasts, OK? And then this article is a really good one. Um, it's a great lesson. It's actually a whole lesson idea. I'm going to click on it. Um, Molly found us this one. And so here's one where we're using our listening skills to find out the difference between real and fake news. And if you take a second and read through the article, um, and then it gives you the actual lesson plan. It gives you the links for where you need to go. Um, you can even get the transcript to go with it. So this is a really good one that can be used in various different classes, depending on you know what what your goal is. But again, using this information to kind of teach things in a little bit different way, as opposed to just define fake news and define um, real news, for example. Okay. Well, and I think it reinforces the fact, too, that, you know, if you're talking about evaluating what you're reading or listening to, right, it's one thing to look at a website. It's another thing to listen to somebody and go, hmm, how do I know if they're telling me the truth? You know, if anybody can create a podcast, how do I know what they're telling me isn't biased? You know, I, th I think that's a really important skill for students to work on 
And what I like about one of the ones, I know you just scrolled through it, but um, they had an option there for having students role play, you know, read something, read a dialogue and record it. And that's really great for speaking and listening. But, you know, I think in terms of, of language, that's something that I worked with an ESL teacher on for a while was having students record themselves and hear themselves was one of the most powerful learning tools that they had was getting to hear their own voices. So, you know, whether you're working with young learners who are learning to read aloud or if you're working with, um, you know, kids that are learning different language, that can be a really powerful thing to do. And then coming back to what Molly said about, um, you know, students hearing their own voices is a powerful thing. When you first start doing these things, they'll say they don't want to hear their voice. But as they work through it and as they do more and more of these, what you find is they're actually cultivating communication skills that, you know, weren't necessarily intentional in doing this, but they're learning how to be better communicators, better speakers, how to, you know, really enunciate and do the things that we need them to do to be good communicators. So just a little side note there. All right. All right. Any questions about how people are using podcasts in general? I mean, that's kind of vague, but essentially for us, what we're going to look at or what we want to think about is how can we use podcasts in either a flipped or blended environment? How can we use it as either a jump start to our information or as an extension of our information when we're having students a supplement and when we're having students, you know, try to do things in a multimodal fashion, especially now when they're having to do so much work asynchronously. Okay. I right. really like that it allows students some freedom in not just choice, but freedom in movement. You know, we're seeing a lot of kids sitting in front of a computer when they're on a remote day, whether they're remote every day or remote just a couple of the days. And this gives them a little bit more of that freedom. So, um, you know, that's just one way that we can use it now as a solution. But again, I think it's it's a really great tool when you mentioned the idea of centers. So uh, Melissa just asked a question, how young are the students that you have used podcasts with? And um, I was in an elementary school, Melissa. I used clips from podcasts all the way with my youngest kindergarten, first grade. Um, would not play them a whole thing, just, you know, but if they can sit through a read aloud, if they can sit through a, um, you know, w whether you're reading it or you're playing it, right? If it's a, if it's an audio book or an ebook or something like that, you can, you can do the same thing with a podcast, just like anything though, you want to preview it before you play it. Um, but there's some, some great things out there that are even for your youngest learners. I had a teacher. Sorry, Chris. Um, I have an AIG teacher. Catherine mentioned um, a really great idea. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow, Catherine, but an AIG teacher who played podcasts. There's one called Mars Patel, and that is a fiction podcast. Um, so it's a series. The kids learn what series means that you listen one after the other. And she would have, just like you would have a read aloud, you'd have, she'd have discussion questions ready. But what she found was the kids would be up and moving around the room. They wouldn't be sitting in their desk. You know, they might go sharpen a pencil. They may choose to go sit in a bean bag to listen. Um, and she just hit play and it was a few minutes for her to catch up on email, things like that. Um, and then they'd have discussion questions. And they would break down, you know, if they missed the read aloud or if they missed the podcast, they would be able to listen from home or catch up before the next one, which is a really cool flexibility piece of that as well. Thank you for sharing that. That's really great. I see that Catherine shared um, another podcast that she's used recently. So that's perfect. And I mean, and that's the uh, getting back to the grade levels thing and stuff. That's that's one of the reasons why I am so passionate or we're so passionate about podcasting is it doesn't pigeonhole you to any particular grade level you can find ways to use it across the board from pre-k really up through college um again i mentioned earlier that my daughter's in college right now she's had some assignments that have been supplemented by podcasts um but as we go through some of these examples of what people are listening to or what teachers are having students listen to um you'll get to see some concrete examples of the things that teachers are using with their students but you know it's a vast world out there um these examples that i'm getting ready to show you it can be overwhelming if you're not used to doing this 
to try to find a podcast to start with um, if you haven't looked for them before. So we're trying to curate um, a, a, at least a decent list of some things to get you jump started, but we want to add to that as we go. What's cool about some of these resources is um, the way that they have the information broken down for you. So for example here, over here on the left hand side, uh, this link will take us to an article from Common Sense Education, 16 great podcasts for the classroom. So I'm just going to click on that real quick and <clears throat> show you how Common Sense, and if you're not familiar with Common Sense Education, they're a great resource for a lot of things. Um, and they are, you know, you can trust them. But again, like Molly said, you always want to be sure, just like if you're using a YouTube video, just if you're going to assign an article or anything else, that you vet whatever the resource is that you're going to share with your students to start with. OK, now, if you come down and you look, um, what they do is they'll give you the name of the podcast. So, ex for example, this is Circle Round. It gives you the grade levels that it's appropriate for. So in this case, it's pre-K through five. Um, and it tells you what the podcast itself is about and possibly if there's any other resources available with it. And then you can actually click on the link itself to go to that podcast um, and find the resources maybe that you might be looking for. Okay, so find the stories um, here and use those on your own. OK, the thing about podcasts is, is, is mm, I won't say all because you can never say all right, but 99% um, of them, I will say that, are free to use. All right. And all you need is a link to be able to use them. So we have circle round pre-K five, but why? So circle round is is a fiction podcast. It's more storytelling, whereas but why is a nonfiction podcast? All right. Story Pirates, grades K-5. And so you may be thinking, well, there's a lot of K-5 information there. There is. Now we're going to move up into some of the middle grade stuff. So we can go grades 1-6, Reigns On, 1-8, 3-6. And it's going to just continue to gradually get higher and higher as we go. And you see there's that stuff you missed in history class that I referenced just a second ago. Um, this American Life, for those of us that listen to that. You know, think about when you're listening to some of those episodes, there's information in those. There's stories within those that we could use in class. This, I believe, 1619. So, again, what they're giving you here at Common Sense is a good mix of fiction and nonfiction and a good mix to span the grade levels. OK, what I like about this Common Sense Media article is that, like, for example, Code Switch does have some that are not necessarily kid friendly, but if you look on the description, it says a playlist of kid friendly episodes. So again, listen beforehand. Um, they usually are really good about marking it, whether it like, not that there's usually ex expletive content, but they will specifically say, you know, this is, is has a younger topic, right? Versus, and then like, I love this, why it's good for kids. So it'll specifically explain um, what you could talk about with students. So I just wanted to mention that because I listened to it too. I listened to Code Switch and I was like, um, this is definitely not one of those kid-friendly episodes. So, <laughs> you know, it's okay. There's plenty to learn, but um, that one in particular, I, I really like how they addressed it in the article. And then when you read this kid-friendly um, episode guide, it tells you there is another one that I can't remember but in that Common Sense Media article that Chris shared with you, um, I think it was maybe This American Life, but it had like educator guides for some of the episodes. So again, if you've listened to something and you really enjoy it, it's easy to talk about it. If you're like, I don't really know exact, there you go, yep, education resources. So a lot of them already have things built in specifically for teachers. I just wanted to make sure to point that out. And I mean, that's that's crucial and very important because we're already trying to do so many things right now. Right. So if we can find some valuable resources and if we can find some things that are already made up that we can adapt and use, then we should absolutely take advantage of that. All right. So moving forward over here on the right hand side, Civics 101 is created by New Hampshire Public Radio. Um, it's obviously a social studies based podcast. 
Um, but what's kind of cool about it is, and I'll just kind of go through and I'll show you some of the examples. So if you go to the episodes page, it breaks it down by year and then each episode um, comes through. So, you know, right now when we're talking so much about uh, the possibility of, of funding for the United States Postal Service, maybe you want to discuss some information about that. Now, while this is listed as a social studies podcast, maybe you're going to use this in another class for a uh, an opinion paper or to to create a debate or do something like that all right so it gives you the entire podcast it will give you a graphic organizer to go along with it it just depends on the episode what resources are available you can download the entire transcript to go with it all right and then usually at the bottom it has it broken up into segments for you of course now they say that it won't do it for this one but usually it will break it up into segments so that you don't have to necessarily listen to the whole thing, okay? So this was the one I was talking about earlier when I said that a lot of times they'll break it down into segments for you um, and you can find those segments to share with your students. So, Chris, yes, a good question. Melissa asked, what would you advise we consider for kids to be able to access the podcast? Chris briefly mentioned costs. Do students and parents have to create an account to listen to podcasts? Okay, so that's, again, one of the really, really cool things about this is, no, most of the time you do not. Most of the time you are able to freely download the podcast since it's free and um, widely available. You can download the podcast and you could so depending on your situation you can download the podcast and you can put it say in your google drive and share that link um or you could just share the link from the podcast itself most of these and again i don't want to say all but most of these resources um well i will say all of the ones that we're sharing today are things that you can access without an account at all um so if you have the link to your whatever your podcast episode is, how you got to it. If you share that link with your students, they'll be able to access it. Perfect. Okay, so Melissa asked you if, if this chat is being captured in the recording, and I want to make sure it's not like Google Meet where it will show up on the side kind of in live time. Instead, what it will do is you can go back to this link anytime. Um, but I would make sure, and so you would see it, it would, you wouldn't see the video playing, but you can still read the chat. It's kind of interesting. Um, but what I would recommend is if you're capturing some really good ideas to copy paste and, and keep it in a Google Doc, um, just in case you can't get back to this link. So the other thing, sorry to interrupt Chris for just a second, but sure. in the chat, Catherine um, had a really cool lesson of what she did. She teaches AIG K6. So I asked her if she would unmute and share something that she's done with podcasts. Please. Um, I used the um, podcast that I linked in there. It was the one on um, the history of video games. Um, and what I did, what, oh, from Brains On, that was, that's where it came from. Um, and I linked it into um, a Google Doc and I had the kids listen to it. And then I had them compare um, what kind of video games they had in their home compared to the older video games that were discussed in the podcast. And then I also had them write about where video games are going in the future, given what they've seen it come through the stages, like it goes back to the Atari um, and things like that. Then a lot of them discussed actually um, how there used to be just a joystick and now their remotes have two joysticks. Um, and how they used to be connected with a cord and now they're not. Um, so I just used a collaborative Google Doc so they could just see each other's answers. Um, I kind of wish I'd used Flipgrid <laughs> now that I reflect <laughs> on it, but um, that's how I used the uh, podcast. It was really simple and I probably could have done more with it, but that was how I used it. But I think that's such yeah. a good example of like an entry point, you know, an entry point can be everybody listening to the same thing and just reflecting on it. And, and I think that's perfect for that age level, too. Um, yes. Certainly don't downplay and say that, you know, you could have done more with it. That's that's an amazing lesson. 
um, and you can build on that moving forward. You get them started in one way, and then you can, you know, you can go from there. Um, what that was you, with I, um, mostly fourth through sixth graders was what I used it with, but I did have my second and third graders um, listen, um, and they kind of just shared with me in a Zoom meeting what they thought um, because they're not as good with the technology as the fourth through sixth right. graders are, but they were still able to think about it. Um, but they, they didn't do the whole Google Doc and the lessons and stuff like that. So. so one of the things that you said there goes back to what Melissa asked about, which is, you know, how would you recommend sharing? So sharing the link in a Google Doc, that's amazing. So if you were, say you were going to have your students, um, and I'm not sure what grade level you're teaching, Melissa, um, but say you, you were going to have your students listen to a podcast and you wanted them to do some sort of reflection, all you would have to do would be, if you're a Google Docs person, you could create that doc, put that link in the doc and have them follow it. And then as they're listening, they could be working on that reflection or they could go back to it later. Um, so really, as long as as they have an Internet connection, um, if you share the link, then they're they're good to go. They can get to the information. If you have a problem with connectivity, then my suggestion would be, like I said before, perhaps save it to your Google Drive or share it in your classroom and have your students download it to their device because it can be downloaded um, so that they can go back and listen to it as well. All right. And you support K-12. So yeah, like I said, it's it, that's one of the great things about the podcasting realm is that so much of it is free and you are able to use it without a lot of, without a lot of the constraints that you might find elsewhere. Okay. So continuing here, looking at some examples, um, these kid casts, uh, Molly helped me to find these. Um, so if you look, Molly, you want to talk a little bit about these? If you want me to open one of them up? Sure. Um, so this is the same thing that I shared earlier in the chat about kid casts and the question about is there anything specific for math? Well, School Library Journal has made this really easy to, um, I think they, they've been doing this for a couple of years, but specifically during the time of remote learning earlier this year, and then starting, like the math one, I think just came out a couple of weeks ago, but they're constantly finding really great podcasts based around topics. So yes, you're gonna have math or civics, but then you also have some, you know, high interest topics like pets, right? And there is a really great one for um, kids who like to cook. So if you like, you know, your kids that like watching uh, Food Network, for example, they have a whole list of, of kid friendly ones. So these are really and then you've got hot topics like that one. Right. But go up one. You don't have to click on. But this like climate change and activism. Hello. Very, very timely. Um, great for your science classes, but doesn't mean you couldn't also. Again, we've talked a lot about that threat of literacy. Um, if you have kids who are really interested in, in what's going on in the news or what's going on with with weather and maybe climate change, that would be a great thing um, to give them as an option, right? Just to listen and reflect and like Chris said, maybe write an opinion paper on. Um, and then uh, this one came out earlier this year with, with Black Voices. So yes, you're gonna get some things about historical figures and activism, but there's also uh, just your everyday variety. It's not just focused on um, equity matters, but just elevating, amplifying um, black voices, which I thought was really special and, and you know, again, timely, but important. Um, and I, I really think that what I love about this is it takes that step of when you go on Google Podcasts or you go on Apple Podcasts, it's overwhelming. You know, I even narrow it down to just a few of my favorite podcasts, and I still struggle sometimes to find one episode I want to listen to right now. This makes this a lot easier if you're looking for content um, to use with your kids. So we have some that are on the website, but if you look at what Chris is showing you right now on the screen, um, scroll down just a little bit, Chris. Yeah, I'm trying to find that link to the whole. Yeah, it but... takes just a second to load. But when you scroll down through the end, you'll see here on the bottom. Oh, go back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's okay. Okay, so see all these boxes? These are all your tags for the articles. So you can click on podcasts or you can click on KidCasts and it will give us give you um, every article that School Library Journal has 
So here's their newest one. Kids Craving Scary Stories. Oh my gosh. In the library starting in September and all through October, that was the number one thing kids asked for. Yeah. So I really love that they take the <laughs> some of the hard part of going and scouring the internet and they just drop it right here for you. There's your math for K-12 yeah. students. Um, book creators, Max summer writing. Yeah. So, so yeah. this is just a really you know I, it, to me it's a shortcut but a really powerful helpful one and and you know that's and so we get back to the idea of it can be over you can go to google and you can type in just about any subject and podcast and you're going to find some examples um but if you start out with if you're just starting out and if you start out with using some of these examples then you do have a little bit of of um, comfort zone there in in knowing that this is stuff that has been recommended for classroom use and then you can work towards finding things on your own vetting them out finding segments doing that kind of stuff and the more savvy you get then obviously the more stuff that you'll be able to find okay anybody else have any before I get into what teachers are listening to on their own anybody have anything else that they've used in class besides what um, Catherine shared with us All right. So now down here we have podcasts for teachers and these are going to be more along the lines of, you know, things that teachers are listening to for their own professional development. Um, our ILC or excuse me, our podcast PDNC and our moments of inspiration would be podcasts that would fall under this heading. OK, um, the Cult of Pedagogy podcast is extremely popular. It's a really great podcast. Um, Jennifer Gonzalez has a lot of great information um, that she shares through this. And when you click on this, you can go in and basically listen to the entire archive here. ISTE, um, EdTech questions. So, you know, if you're feeling EdTech nerdy or you just want to go through and, and look at the list, what's great about both of these is that, <coughs> excuse me, you don't have to listen to them in any certain order. You can go through and find the episodes that you particularly want to listen to um, and you can listen to those and those only. So if you have some ed tech questions, maybe go through and look at the list of what the ISTE podcast has to offer you and see if there's something there that can help you out. So can I talk real quick about the cult of pedagogy one? You sure can. You want me to open it? Um, sure. So a couple of things, if you're not familiar with this and somebody did mention it when you asked that question at the very beginning, Chris. So um, I know there are probably folks that are familiar, but, you know, when we talk about using podcasts in the classroom. Obviously, we meant in terms of, you know, how can you play them and include them with your students? But this is a go to resource for me. This is probably the first po first thing that got me into listening to podcasts a couple years ago um, and actually shutting down, you know, like my audiobooks that I wanted to listen to instead, um, because there's so much to learn. She really does a great job of interviewing um, teachers. So all of this is pretty much coming directly from the classroom. And then she also interviews people like there's a great episode with her and John Spencer talking about, you know, what is makerspace? What is design thinking? And how do those two things come together? So, you know, it might not be a podcast that you play out loud to your students, but it is going to translate um, into what you are probably going to want to do in your classroom. So um, Chris, you mentioned this, that this is not something you have to listen to in order. There's a lot. Stop on this one, though. This is really great. Um, what I really like about her episodes is that you can do this quick. I love her website where I can look and see who she has as a guest, right? And maybe I recognize somebody. For example, this historically responsive literacy episode. I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm 100% going to because Goldie Muhammad wrote this book called Cultivating Genius. It was the best book I've read maybe longer than just even this year. So I will listen to this just because I love the guest and I know what the topic's going to be. And I, you know, it's going to make me tune in. I may not choose creative blogs because I personally don't have a student to do student blogs with. But, you know, again, I, I just wanted to point out that she does feature, sometimes she features a guest, but if you look at this one in the middle here, she's going to be talking about how she uses them with her students. So you're getting both. You're getting her stories from the classroom and you're getting, you know, kind of these experts who are talking about their specific thing. 
So I just wanted to point that out. And she also includes um, resources and a transcript. So if for some reason you're in this podcasting session, which we only have a couple minutes left on, and you're like, I would rather read it on the screen than listen to it. Well, guess what? You can. You can read her whole transcript as a blog post. Very visual appealing. Okay, that's all. I just wanted to explain. I just, I think that it's a great example of, you know, why as an educator I should listen to a podcast if it's not something I'm going to play for my kids. Right. And and for me, because we are getting down on time, this teaching Keating with Weston and Molly is is one of those for me. These are a little bit shorter, but what I like about this one is I'm a movie buff and they like to take movies and tie it into educational um, topics. So, for example, today I just listened to the Few Good Men episode. So if it's a movie that I like, um, I'll usually go in and listen to, you know, what they have to say. Um, and they, you know, they do a good job as well. Uh, theirs are a little bit, some, most of theirs run in the 30 minute range. So um, it's kind of interesting to sort of hear what they have to say. But again, doesn't have to be listened to in any particular order. And they come right out and say, you may agree or disagree with us. And they, you know, they invite you to, to have some discussion with them, you know, through their social media and that kind of stuff. So these aren't, these podcasts that are listed here are not ones that we would share in class, but they're ones that we would use to help our own teaching practices. So for example, if you're interested in learning more about flipped learning, this flipped learning radio podcast is a is a great resource for you because they have guests and things that talk about all facets of flipped learning. 10 minute teacher podcast, maybe you take a 10 minute walk every day and you want something to listen to while you do that. The 10 minute teacher podcast again every weekday gives you some some good information. So um these are all, you know, just good resources for us to have to listen to. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm actually going to add a section to this to, you know, what teachers are listening to for pleasure, because I think that's a good idea, too. So we can start sharing some of those out there, just like we did at the beginning of the session. Yeah, so all those good ideas that you gave to us, we're just going to collect them <laughs> and put them out here. <laughs> so if you keep this website handy, that's where you can find all those good resources. So it is 317. I don't want to hold you guys past um, the time that you've allotted for today. But if there's any questions, concerns, things you want to share or add, please feel free to do so. Um, we appreciate you guys having been here today. I hope that you got some good information that you can use from this. Here's the QR code if you're using that or the other information that you need. I would encourage each and every one of you, if you're interested in creating podcasts and you don't have any experience doing it, or even if you do, but you want to see some some of the tips and things that we're going to talk about, to join us tomorrow at two o'clock as well. Um, that's when we're going to do the creating podcasts. So we'll get a little bit more into both Chris and I have used them with students and with teachers. And we've helped a couple folks recently create podcasts. Um, so we're excited to be able to help you through that. If, if this is something that you're like, I want to take it beyond just sharing what's already out there. Um, Haley asked uh, where to find the kid casts. So Chris had shared a couple of those right on the website that you had access to. So um, you can click through some of them there, but those are from School Library Journal. So if you search for kid casts and School Library Journal, that would be a great place to start. And like I said, they have um, a really helpful way to click. On, like if you scroll to the bottom of one of those articles, on the bottom has that square that says KidCast, and you can see all of them. I went ahead and put that information in there as well. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yes, Cynthia says, um, if you can't listen in tomorrow at 2, will the recording be posted? Absolutely, we will record it. Um, and, and again, you can listen in and hopefully get some ideas. And I mentioned this earlier in the chat, but if you take it to the level of you're going to create your own, 
and you have questions along the way, please send us an email. Email Chris first. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but he's really helped me and taught me a lot. So um, I will be more than happy to tell you my experience in 2020 learning how to podcast. But Chris is who's taught me all I know. So um, we'd be happy to give you a little bit of, of coaching as much as we possibly can. Thank you, Cynthia. And yeah, any, please feel free to contact us. This is what we like to do. So if you can't listen in tomorrow and you can't stomach the idea of listening on your own, which I can understand, but you're <laughs> interested in doing some of this, then please reach out to us. Absolutely. Um, go ahead. Go ahead, Molly. Well, she, uh, Cynthia asked, what do we both, what did we both teach? So I um, was in an elementary library. It's at Manio Elementary School for seven and a half years. So that's my uh, background. And I was a high school Spanish teacher and a football coach. And I count the football coaching as teaching, too, because trust me, that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So and I, I really love when Chris shared that idea about listening to podcasts um, as a language learner, because I studied French and I studied Italian, which I should have just probably gone on to teach one of those because I loved it. But, um, I, you know, it's so true what you said, Chris, about listening to others, you know, whether it's something in a podcast that has to do with like a topic, but really hearing multiple speakers in different languages is really powerful. So that's one of my favorite pieces of advice that you give folks. Well, thank you. I, I just, I mean, I always found that with my kids. It was like, I need you to, I need you to hear somebody other than me speak Spanish because... Even though I'm awesome, I might not be doing it all right. Right. And I, I had a great, uh, my, my French teacher was one of my favorites, but he was from, which is not a bad thing. He was from Quebec. And so he would always say, if you go to France, you're not going to understand anybody. If I'm the only French speaker you'll hear, <laughs> you know, that it's, it's just different. And it was the same in Spanish. And and it, what was funny was the last school I taught at, we actually had Spanish teachers from three different places whose accents and the things that they said, they did it in three different ways. And I was constantly having to explain to the students that, you know, it's the same as dialects in the United States or dialects of English, speaking English in the United States versus in Australia versus in Britain. It's the same thing. So mm -hmm. that's the truth. That's why Siri gives us so many options <laughs> for how we want to hear, you know, what accent of English would you like? It's kind of <laughs> All right. Well, it seems like we're going to have a lot of people join us tomorrow. So that's exciting. And like Chris said, if you can't join us, the recording will be there. And worst case scenario, you can send us an email. We'll be happy to chat. That's right.